question for you this morning. A question for you. Have you ever, as a child, run away from home? Let's have a show of hands. Do you mean teenage years? Have you ever decided that I've had enough? Had enough of my parents? Had enough of this teenage thing? Running? We've got, we got a crowd of runners here. Wow, he's a bit teenager. Hey, someone said it was last week. I think it's a pretty common thing. I think it's a pretty common thing, isn't it? Now, my story, I was about 13 at the time, and uh, I uh, must have had one of those weeks, you know, as a kid, but you just can't seem to do anything right. Yeah? You ever had one of those? Yeah. yeah. And I've done something wrong, and I got in trouble for it, and I thought, that's it. You know, my 13-year-old brain said, you know what, I'm going to run away. Run away from home. Now, my family had uh, converted a garage in this house to my bedroom, so that meant that I had a front door and I had a rear door. I could go out the front or the back of the house. And uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't actually advise that for your parents in this room. Don't give your 13-year-old kid a door to the outside world. I don't know that that actually works out too well. But uh, I had a choice. So I thought, okay, what have I got in my room? I scrounged in my backpack, my school bag. I had like an apple I hadn't eaten for lunch. And I had uh, some paper and a pen and a book in case I got bored. And I thought, chuck it all into my backpack, grab my bike, out the back door of my room. And I'm standing in the backyard thinking, great, I've run away from home. <laughs> standing in the backyard. And it was all going really, really well until about 12 seconds later I thought to myself, where on earth am I going? And I had nowhere to go. And uh, I was just sitting there thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Do I, do I go down to the bus stop? I don't even know where the bus stop is. Do I have some money for the bus? And even if I did, where would I go? I had no idea where I was going, but I knew I was running away from home. But then I thought to myself, well, you know what, maybe it's not as important for me to run as it is for my parents to think that I've run. So, you know, maybe I didn't really need to run away from home, but maybe I just wanted them to think that I'd run away from home. So what I did is I stepped stood by the back door with my ear to the door, waiting and waiting and waiting to hear if mum or dad would say, where's Matt? Where's he gone? He's run away. I think that was more important to me to be noticed to have been running away from home than actually to be running away from home. I see some nods in the room. I think some people have been there. Yeah. So I waited, and 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 nothing. So I looked at my watch, and I've been out there for about three minutes. <laughs> you know what it's like. And I waited, and I waited some more, and I think I got to about 40 minutes. Like, you know, I've got some survival instincts. I've got to say, I don't want to mention me in bed rules in the same sentence, but I was on the back of a motorbike yesterday. So, you know, like I was out there for 40 minutes, and I thought, you know what? I haven't heard anything. Mum and Dad don't even know that I've gone. So I thought, you know what, this is ridiculous. I came back inside. I think I was greeted by mum and dad and everything was fine. But have you ever run away from home as a kid? Yeah. I think it's pretty common. You know, I think the most common part of that story, and I think we had time to go around the room and, and hear some of your funny stories about times you tried to like, run away from home. I think one of the commonalities we find, and it's going to come up on the screen right now, is that we don't often run to things. We run from things. Yeah. You know, when you run, you don't run from something. You run to something. Actually, it's the other way around, isn't it? Yeah. You don't run to something, you run from something. It's about getting away, isn't it? It's about getting away more than reaching a destination. And I didn't even know where the bus stop was. And I'm sure your story is similar to mine. So my question for you this morning as we start this brand new series about Jonah is this next question. Is what are you running away from that perhaps you should be running to? What are you running away from that perhaps you should be running to? So for the next five weeks, we're going to be studying the story of the world's most famous runaway. His name is Jonah. We find him in the scriptures. And in fact, if you've got your Bibles with you, now's a good time to turn because it might take you the next 15 minutes to actually find the book of Jonah. <laughs> it's a little bit of a tricky one. Um, the easiest way to do it is to get to where the New Testament starts and go backwards. If you start at Genesis, you'll never find it. It's mm -hmm. one of those little ones, about seven books before the start of the New Testament, about halfway in your Bible. Jonah is the most famous Runaway. And if you've been around church for any length of time, or maybe you went to Sunday school as a kid, or you had uh, scripture lessons in school, you've probably heard the story of Jonah and the whale. Jonah and the whale. whale. Jonah and the whale. Well, yeah, that's right. It's a big fish or a whale. We don't quite know what that is. There's something in the translation there. But you know the story of Jonah and the whale. If you've never heard the story of Jonah and the whale, let me give you like a 30,000 foot view. Let me give you like a quick overview of the story. Jonah is a prophet. That means that God would speak to him, and he would tell the people, the Israelite people, God's chosen people, what God was saying. Jonah was a good prophet. Um, we found out in 2 Kings, when we first met Jonah in the Bible, that he actually had prophesied before. People knew that they could listen to what he said from God. So Jonah was asked from God to go to a city called Nineveh. 
Nineveh was an interesting place. We'll talk a bit more about that later. But Jonah, instead of going to Nineveh, gets on a boat and flees as far away from Nineveh as he can. Now, if you're going to run away from God, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea, a boat is probably not the safest place to be running, would you say? So Jonah uh, is in this boat. There's a big storm that comes. The sailors get angry. Jonah says, yeah, it's all here because I've run away from God. So he says, why don't you throw me overboard? So they do. Jonah is falling down into the depths of the ocean, and he gets eaten by a whale or a big fish. Now, the story goes that Jonah was in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. And while he was in the belly of the fish, he prays to God and repents, and the fish vomits him up on the land, and then he goes to Nineveh, where he should have gone in the first place, and uh, he preaches to the Ninevite people, tells them what God had told him to say, and they repent. They come back to God. What an awesome story. Now, I know that for some of you sitting there going, that on that, you don't expect me to believe that, do you? You don't expect me really to believe that a man lived inside a fish for three days and three nights and then was spat out on the dry land. You don't expect me. Come on, let's give a whale on the tail. No, it's a bit of a fishy story. You know, it's a bit tough to swallow. I said, I, said I, I said to myself before I started, I wasn't going to go for any puns. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm but some of you are sitting there thinking, I can't, I can't go there. I can't get that. It's just a bit weird to me. And it does sound a bit strange to our modern sensibility. It doesn't mean being swallowed by a fish. You know what? If you can't quite get there, if you can't quite swallow that story this morning, if that's a little bit too far, I'm going to let you off the hook this time. Sorry, I really do have many of these things. And I'll let you off the hook this morning. Because I think it's more important for us to engage with the story over the next five weeks than it is for us to believe the historical accuracy of the story. Do you get what I'm saying? I think it's more important for us to engage with the story and hear what God wants to say to us than for us to actually go through the motions of actually believe this historically happened in fact. I will tell you, though, that I actually do believe this story happened. I believe it happened just how it said it happened. I think I've got three good reasons for that. First reason I believe it happened is that it's actually told in a historical sense. Jonah is a real person. Nineveh is a real place. You know, these things actually happened at a point in history. We know that. Second reason I believe it actually happened, and you may not, and that's okay. The second reason I believe that actually happened is actually that uh, Jesus himself refers to Jonah. We find in Matthew chapter 12, the Pharisees are saying to Jesus, send us a sign and tell us that you're a son, the son of God. And Jesus says, you know what, I'm not going to tell you to send you a sign. You're a wicked and deceitful generation, and no sign will be given to you except the sign that was already given to Jonah. He tells them that in a historical sense, not a fact sense, not a, not a fairy tale sense. He's not referring them to the story of Cinderella. He's referring them to a historical story that they knew about. And just, he says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man, Jesus himself, will be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. And there's a parallel there. It says, I am actually the greater Jonah. One greater than Jonah is here. But I figure if anyone would know that this story was true or not, Jesus probably would, right? Yeah. yeah. Third reason I think it's true is, uh, well, if you believe... Go with me for a second. If you believe that God created all things, that there is a God out there that is over and above and in all things, and that he can create everything out of nothing, if you believe all of that, surely a man surviving in a three, fish for three days is smallish. Sorry, sorry. Small um, surely it's not too far to go, right? That's why I believe. But if you can't get there this morning, I respect that. I respect that. And uh, it's more important to me that you engage with the story for the next five weeks and track with it and try and find out what it's saying to you than it is for me to prove to you that this happened in actual fact in history. Are you with me? Yeah. You okay? Yeah. So with that in mind, and if you'll allow me one final pun, let's dive right in. Uh, Up on the screen. <laughs> now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come up before me. Jonah got up to flee from to flee to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. Now, first thing we need to know. The story is not about Jonah. Now, I know the story is titled Jonah. I know that Jonah is the main character. I understand all of that. This story is not about Jonah. Look at the first sentence. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. It doesn't say, now, Jonah was a prophet once upon a time, and he was this man, and then one day he went out and heard the word of the Lord. No, the story starts with Jonah. Oh, sorry, the story starts with the word of the Lord coming to Jonah. This is not a story about Jonah. This is a story about God. 
Let's get that straight from the beginning. This is a story about God, not a story about Jonah. And let me explain to you why that's important. If this is a story about Jonah, if we're looking to Jonah to be the main character here, then we're going to try to view Jonah as a hero. We're going to try and insert ourselves into that story. We're going to try and see parallels to Jonah. We're going to try and see a moral in Jonah's life that we can apply to our own. We're going to try and see a happy ending for Jonah. And let me tell you, we'll find out in five weeks' time. None of that happened. This is actually a story about God and how God speaks to Jonah, about how God deals with Jonah, about how God relates to Jonah. And I believe that as we look at this story, if we seek to look at Jonah, we're going to miss the point. But if we seek to look at God, if we seek to look at how God relates to Jonah, that will hold a mirror to our own hearts. That will expose our own souls. And that will help us to learn something of valuable importance. Are you with me? This is not a story about Jonah. This is a story about God. In fact, um, we find out that, that, that Jonah actually is very, um, he's the main character of the story, but he's not actually the protagonist. He's actually the antagonist. He's actually the one that causes the issues in the story. He's not the one that actually causes the story to move forward. So actually, Jonah is not the main part of the story. This is a story about God. When we're looking at God in this story, I think over the next five weeks, we're going to find three things. And I'm going to tell you them up front. So that as we move through the series, I think you're going to know where we're heading. I think that's really important for us. I'll come up on the screen. I think we learned three things about God. I'm going to go through them really quickly on the next slide. Thank you. Um, about God. The first is we're going to learn from this story that God is eminently righteous, yet unendingly merciful. This is where we're heading. God is eminently righteous. That means he's holy. He's righteous. He's the only one that is holy. And because of that, he demands retribution for sin and wrongdoing. Yet he is unendingly merciful. He is always willing to restore. He is always willing to offer mercy. He is always willing to rehabilitate relationships. The second thing we'll learn is that God desires our hearts and our attitudes more than just our obedience. <coughs> more important for our hearts and our attitudes to be with God than our lip service. And the third thing is that God's heart is towards all people, not just the religious. Now Jonah, as a prophet, knew these truths about God. Jonah spoke to God regularly. Jonah knew the scriptures. He knew what God was like. He knew these truths about God. In fact, Jonah's father's name, we read in that first, uh, first sentence, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Amittai literally means truth. So it wouldn't be too far of a stretch to say that Jonah came from truth. Jonah was descended from truth. You know, Jonah knew the truth about God. He knew these three things. He was literally the son of so let's see what happens when the word of the Lord comes to Jonah, the son of truth, who knows what God is saying. Let's see what happens with that. Let's go to the next slide. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because the evil has come up before me. At this point in the story, I should probably let you know a little bit about Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. These people were notorious for their violence. These people were notorious for their warmongering, and they were actually sworn enemies of Israel. They were on the northern border of Israel, and they would always be coming in and attacking and pillaging the towns. Now, the Assyrians, the Ninevites, were renowned for their violent and wicked ways. In fact, I couldn't tell you all the things that I've read this week about the Ninevites, because it would spoil your lunch. It really would. A couple of things I probably can tell you. If you've got a squeamish stomach, just cover your ears for a second. They were actually really skilled at skinning people alive. They would do that and they would bury them up to their head in the sand and allow them to die from dehydration. Oh. The other thing that they would do is they would go through a town and destroy the town. They would leave the heads of the men in a pyramid by the, side, by the door of the town, by the gate of the town, as a symbol and a sign that Nineveh had been through here. These guys were violent. They were bloodthirsty. So think about this. Jonah is God's prophet. Nineveh and the Assyrians are the sworn enemy of the Israelite people. And God says to Jonah, go over there because I want you to tell them that they, 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 their wrongdoing has come up before me and I am now boiling over with anger and I'm going to smash them. If you're Jonah, that's the perfect assignment for you. Is it not? That's the perfect assignment for you. These guys are your enemies. And God's telling me to go over there and pronounce his judgment. I should, Jonah should just be, yes, God, yes, I will be there. I'll do that. I'll do that. Except he doesn't. Except... He doesn't. Let's have a look at what happens next. Next slide. Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish 
from the Lord's presence. He went down to Joppa and found the ship going to Tarshish. You know, Jonah got up and he didn't go to Nineveh. He ran. Why did he run? Isn't that crazy? Well, maybe your first thought is he might have run because the Ninevites were such violent people. That would make sense, right? Would you go to your enemy and tell your enemy up to their face that you know God's going to destroy you if that's how violent they were? Well, that's one possibility. Except we find a little later in the story that Jonah was not a cowardly man. We find a little later that he actually told sailors when he was in the storm on the sea to throw him overboard because he knew that he was the problem. This is not a man of cowardice. This is not a man to run away from a fight. So there must be another reason why Jonah ran. And I think there is a reason why Jonah ran. And I think Jonah ran because we felt because he thought that God's mission would succeed. He thought that God's mission would succeed. Jonah, the son of truth, knew truths about God. And when the word of the Lord came to Jonah, Jonah understood that word. Jonah understood that word so much that he knew that if he went to Nineveh and preached to the Ninevites, we find out in chapter 4, verse 2, he says, I knew that you were a gracious God. I knew that you were a merciful God. And I knew that if I preached to them, they would repent and you would relent and then the relationship would be restored. And my enemies would not be persecuted. They would not be smashed from the face of the earth. You know, Jonah experienced something there where he actually understood what God was saying and said, I don't want that. I don't want that at all. The question for you this morning, what if God responded to your enemies the way that you feel he should respond to your enemies? What if God treated the people that you don't like the way that you would like him to treat those people? What if God treated the people that persecute you as you believe they deserve? None of us would be here. None of us would be here. And here we have Jonah believing that God should treat his enemies the way he thought they deserved to be treated. And God's saying, no, I'm, I'm not like that. I'm not like that. I'm a different God. I'm not like that. Jonah knew that his mission would succeed. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, and Jonah didn't like it. So he ran. He ran as far as he could. Let me help you with that. Up here we'll have a map. So he started not too far from you see Joppa down there in the bottom right corner of the map. And God asked him to go to Nineveh. We're talking about 800, 900 kilometers east, northeast. Over the desert. This is quite a large journey. Go to Nineveh. But what did he do? He goes as far west as he can. He gets on a ship bound for Tarshish. Now, Tarshish is somewhere on the southeast coast of of Spain. Excuse me. Um, It's as far away as you can get. In fact, in those days, that was pretty much the end of the earth. You couldn't go any further, especially on established trade routes. That was the longest ship journey you could get from Joppa to Tarshish. He ran as far as he could. Let's put this in our terms. Uh, If here to Nineveh is here to maybe Bundaberg, here to Tarshish is here to Perth. Think about that. 41 hour drive. And he didn't have a car. That's how far he tried to run, to run away from God. You know, it's not unusual to run to escape from God. It's not unusual. We see it in people, but we also see it in nature, don't we? How many of you have ever noticed what happens to a flock of birds before a storm? What do they do? They will fly away. They will fly away. They will fly away. In fact, they'll fly a long way away. 2014, I came across a study, golden-winged warblers. Now, this was a flock of birds in the United States of America that just took off and left. And they flew 1,500 kilometres. Two days later, a massive storm came through that region. The storm had something like 84 tornadoes, killed something like 35 people. Once the storm had dissipated, the golden wing wallers returned home. The researchers looked at this story and tried to work out what was happening here, and they came to this conclusion. I think it's really interesting. They came to this conclusion that perhaps the golden wing wallers could hear something that humans could not. Perhaps there was some frequency, something that they could hear or perceive that nobody else could hear and perceive, and that caused them to flee. Here's something else that's interesting. The name Jonah in Hebrew means dove. And like a bird, Jonah, at the first sign of trouble, got up and ran to avoid the conflict. Now, what was the conflict? Well, it was an internal conflict, wasn't it? I believe, just like the golden-winged warblers can hear something that humans cannot, Jonah heard something that nobody else could. You see, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, but I believe Jonah was running not from the word of God, but from the will of God. You know, Jonah perceived more than just God speaking to him. He perceived what God wanted to do. 
And that internal conflict between God's will and Jonah's will, that the two were not in, in, uh, in congruency, because of that, he took off and he ran as fast as he could. You know, the will of God is often in conflict with our own will. Haven't you found that in your life? Yeah. The, will of God, the, conflict, the will of God is often in conflict with our own will. Now, how many times do you hear someone say something along the lines of, you know, the heart wants what the heart wants? Well, you can't, you can't choose what the heart wants. Or you can't choose, you know, who you love or what you desire to have or where you go in this life. You know, you've got to follow your heart. You've got to follow your desires. How, how often have you heard that? How often is that in conflict with the will of God? It's interesting. Jonah said to God, the heart wants what the heart wants and my heart does not want that. That was the conflict that Jonah experienced. You know, we're told in Jeremiah... The heart is wicked above all things and deceitful. Who can know it? You know, when we follow our heart instead of the will of God, we find ourselves in conflict. We find ourselves in conflict. Jonah really says to God, I hear what you're saying. But more importantly, I see what you're going to do. Because I know who you are, and I know how you're going to treat my enemies. And I don't like that. And because I don't like that, I'm going to remove myself from the situation. So he tried to run. Now, now, Jonah was smart enough to know that he couldn't outrun God's presence. This is a prophet of God. He spoke to Jonah regularly. And he would have known the scriptures. He would know that in the book of, in the book of Psalms, in the book of Hosea, we find references to the glory of God filling the earth. We find in Psalm 139, where can I hide from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, go as far east as I can. Or if I travel to the far side of the sea, west of Tarshish, even then you will find me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Jonah knew this. He knew that he couldn't escape from God's presence. So why did he run? Why do we run when we know that we can't outrun God? And I think the reason we run, I think the reason that Jonah ran was the act of running was the distraction he needed to not have to deal with his internal conflict. How often do we do that? How often do we fill our lives with things that will try and dull in the pain, will try and reduce the anxiety that we feel, will try and bring us some sense of peace, when really the only peace can be found by bringing our will and God's will into alignment? Are you with me? You can run from God, we'll find this out next week, but you can't outrun God. Jonah knew he couldn't outrun God, but he still ran to dull in the now, I see two problems with running to escape in a conflict. The first is pretty obvious. If you run, who goes with you? Yourself. When you run, you take you with you. And your inner conflict runs with you. So you can run as far as you want, but the conflict is still there, isn't it? And at some point, when you stop running for long enough to be still and to work out what's going on on the inside, conflict resumes. That's the first problem. The second problem with running to escape inner conflict will come up in the next verse. We'll go to the next slide, please. Jonah went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. Now, don't let this be lost on you. This is momentous. Jonah ran to a port city and found, wait for it, a boat. Doesn't that blow your mind? <laughs> Jonah went to a port city and found a boat. Not only that, but he found a boat that was going exactly where he wanted to go. I'd say to you this morning, my friends, that when we run, and come up on the screen, there will always be a boat ready to take us to Tarshish. When you run, there will always be a boat ready to take you to Tarshish. You know, we have an enemy. We don't talk about this as much as we should in church. We have an enemy whose job it is to build boats to take you to Tarshish. There will always be a boat ready to take you to Tashish. You know, this morning, if you're struggling with your finances, if you're struggling to make ends meet, and you're really not sure where your next month's paycheck's going to come from, I guarantee you that there will be an opportunity coming your way very soon, if it hasn't already, where you can take advantage of another person, or where you can embezzle some funds, or where you can steal something from somebody else to make your life more comfortable. I guarantee it, because there will always be a boat ready to take you to Tashish. If you're sitting here this morning, and you're struggling with your marriage, and you're trying to find out whether in your spirit, do I really want to stay with this person or not? 
I guarantee you, there will be someone that will come alongside you, a handsome spiritual man, a gorgeous lady, and they will try and distract you because there will always be a boat ready to take you to Tarshish. I say to you this morning, it's not a boat. It's a trap. It's not a boat. It's a trap. Let me make this as simple as I can for you. Let me make this practical and geographical so it'll stick in your mind and you'll always remember it. If God says to you later today, I want you to get in your car and I want you to drive to Brisbane. And you say, no, God, I don't want to do that. I want to get in my car and drive to Sydney. Let me tell you, every sign you see on your drive will reinforce your decision. Will it not? Every sign you see as you drive to Sydney will reinforce your decision. First sign, Sydney, 400 kilometres. I'm heading in the right direction. Second sign, Sydney, 300 kilometres. Gee, God is blessing this trip, is he not? I'm making good time. I'm going as close as I can. Sydney, 100 kilometres, 50 kilometres. Welcome to Sydney. When you run, there will always be a boat ready to take you to Tarshish. And where you focus determines the signs that you see. <laughs> Some of you this morning are struggling with a midlife crisis, wondering what you should do. And you came to the church this morning and you saw a motorbike on the stage. <laughs> do I need to say any more? <laughs> when we run, we'll always find a way ready to take us to Tashish and our focus determines what we see. So Jonah saw a sign, the very boat he went to Joppa to find. Don't let that be lost on us. So what did he do? Next verse. He paid the fare and went down into it to go with them from Tarshish to the Lord's, from the Lord's presence. He paid the fare. You know, some Bible commentators would actually tell you that he didn't just pay his fare. There's a way that you can interpret this that actually suggests that he paid everybody's fare. That he was in such a hurry to get that boat out of there that he paid for the cargo and the passengers and he paid the lot and went as fast as he could. Haven't you found that in your own lives? That when you run from God, it costs you. It costs you. Maybe not financially. Maybe physically. Maybe spiritually. Maybe emotionally. Maybe relationally. But there is always a cost of running from God. You see, the next slide will tell us running always costs us dearly. It costs us more to run from the will of God than to stay and listen to the will of God. Let me bring this home. Some of you have been running your whole lives. Some of you have been running from God for your whole lives. In fact, some of us in this room have turned running into an art form. You know how to run. You know where to run. And you've heard the will of God. You know what God is saying to you. And perhaps you're delaying your obedience. Perhaps you're saying, God, you know, I hear what you're saying. You're telling me to do this. You're telling me to surrender this. You're telling me not to walk down this road. But you know what? My heart wants better than that. I hear what you're saying, but no. Or perhaps you're saying to God, not yet. Maybe once I close out this business deal, then I'll surrender that side of my life to you. Maybe once uh, I pursue this relationship, then I'll surrender that side of my life to you. Maybe once I kick this habit, or maybe once when I get a little bit more mature, I'll have time on my sick bed when I'm you know, almost going to glory. Come back to you. Let me suggest to you this morning, friends, that delayed obedience is still disobedience. I'm a parent of three young kids. I know very well that if I start to count, my children will wait. If I say one, two, I know I'm going to have to insert two and a half, two and three quarters, two and seven eighths. You know, delayed obedience is still disobedience. Don't wait for God to get you two and seven eights. <laughs> this morning, when the word of the Lord comes to you and the will of God is made known to you, don't run. Stop and listen. Stop and listen. Maybe for some of you this morning, you're not even sure whether this God is you. Maybe you're not even sure whether there is a God. But you still feel that internal conflict. There's something between you and your conscience that doesn't quite sit right. And in the dead of night, when you're, when you're honest with yourself, you realise that maybe someone put that conscience in there. Yeah. yeah, but that's you this morning. Let me suggest that the word of God and the will of God is coming to you. And it's up to you to respond. 
This morning I asked you the question, what are you running from that you should be running to? Over the next five weeks we're going to look at the story of how Jonah ran and how running exposed Jonah's heart and how God responded to that. And I believe that as we look at this story, we're going to learn a lot. So I'd encourage you over the next week, between now and next Sunday, have a look at the book of Jonah. It's four short chapters. It'll take you five minutes to read it. Have a read, look at the story, pray over the story. And as we look at this, as the word of God comes to you in this series, as the will of God is made known to you for your life, don't run. Don't run. Stop and listen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that your word still comes to us. I thank you that you are not slow in revealing your will to us. And I thank you that you have a plan for us. Father, in this room this morning, there are people that realize that they're running from you. Father, when we run, please give us the courage to stop. Please give us the courage to stop. Give us the strength to turn and to listen to what you're saying. Father, as we go through this series, I pray for our people. I pray that you would reveal our hearts, that you would expose our hearts. I pray that you would speak directly to our hearts. And through that, we would have a stronger relationship. Father, for people that have been uh, challenged this morning to stop running, maybe running their whole lives, I pray, Lord, that you would come in your presence and your power, your Holy Spirit would flood their lives. I pray for people this morning that have decided in their hearts to lay down something and follow you. I pray that you would give them the courage to do that through this week. Father, thank you that you love us even when we run. Pray this in Jesus' name.